And welcome to this week's Your Head in the Cloud, but not really Your Head in the Cloud because this week we're doing a recap of the Adobe Max. And I'm joined today by Juliette, a oh. very dear friend of mine. Hello, welcome. Hey, how are you? I'm good. I'm so happy that you're here with me in this oh. digital room. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Yes, of course, my pleasure. Um, we, we should maybe quickly tell how we know each other because I think yeah. that is a bit of a, like how Adobe links people together. How yeah. how did this happen? And it, it's actually a good ad for the creative community. So Absolutely. community fund, which you can still apply to until next year. So Adobe has this program that used to be an annual residency. And for the pandemic, it's been turned into a monthly residency, a month thing. And I applied and this is where I met Sophia. And I think since then we had a lot of conversations about creativity, about being a creative, about the creative industry. And then here we are. Exactly. And I think it's just a really cool example because I'm, you're a designer, I'm a photographer, and we still like have the same interests and conversations about the same topics. And so I'm really excited to talk to you about your favorite sessions of Adobe Max, because that's what we're going to do today. We're going to have our favorite, I think we selected nine in total, which is, sounds like a lot, but it was yeah. so hard to pick them. Because there were so, so many good ones. We um, put them in different categories. So we will talk about a little bit about the features we have. We will talk about the business advice that we think is was really valuable that was shared. And about, I think, our favorite topic, uh, the inspirational part of the Adobe Max sessions. And I'm already looking in the chat people are already tuning in hello everyone we thought about a question of the day for today so our question of the day is what was your favorite adobe max session what would you recommend for people to watch because a lot of the sessions you can still watch on demand now until next year so i would highly recommend even re-watching some stuff because we both re-watch some stuff yeah, for definitely. for this um because you always find new things and i think it's great because during adobe max there were so many sessions that i watched some of them back to back so yeah. obviously at some point your brain cannot <laughs> yes <laughs> all yes. this information so i think it's great to have some more time and rewatch something you really like just to understand okay what was that about yes. uh, is there are things i can still understand about this so yeah yeah, yeah, please don't care because there's also a lot of sessions I could not watch because obviously I'm human and yes. <laughs> I'm and I'm <laughs> We need to sleep at some point. <laughs> like just things. Uh, I want to know what to what to watch, please. Yeah, because I when we talked about it before, you recommended some some sessions that I hadn't seen. Some of them we're going to talk about today, and I was like, oh my god, how could I have missed this? But yeah. it was just so much. So yeah, it's so great yeah. that you can still watch it now. There were so many sessions, so I think we made choices to like in aspiring designers, young designers or young creative at large could be inspired, but by no means this selection is like the best of the best. It's just, I think what is both inspiring and really touched us or told us, taught us something yeah. about, uh, about the creative career. So, yeah. So should we dive in? Should we? Yes jump right into our first first section that we have we thought since obviously at adobe max a lot of new features are introduced um we would um give you a little bit of 
tips or like cool sessions to watch. Um, and obviously the main one that gives you a great overview about what is going on right now is the keynote. I mean, the first thing I feel like also watching it, it was the beginning of Adobe Max. Like it was exciting a little bit. It was like, I mean, I don't want to compare it to Christmas because that might be too much, but it's like, <laughs> oh my God, all these new cool things and you finally see it. And it was so much like so long anticipated that Adobe Max would happen. So yeah. I really liked the keynote. That was cool. And I think it's also important to stay in touch with what uh, Adobe is doing because, yeah. well, the industry is moving fast. And even when you're already a part of it, you can be out of touch quite quickly. So just keeping in touch with the new feature, trying to understand the landscape. I know for me, it's especially important because I tend to, well, just use Illustrator, just stay in my little <laughs> bubble. And even in Illustrator, um, I know how to use some stuff and then I'll, I'll tend not to discover new things. So it yeah. can be a great session just to... Also for me, like obviously I mostly use Photoshop and Lightroom and photo related um, apps, but then you also see other apps and the new stuff that comes out and you're like, hmm, yes. could I maybe use this for something I'm doing, even though I've yes, never thought about it? I think it was very much the case with Fresco, for example, we've yeah. been talking about it for some time now and I'm completely the audience for the app, but because I'm, I'm lazy and a bit maniac like really obsessed by Illustrator I, I tend not to go like use other things but having this overview and being like oh yeah okay so maybe I really need to try this on was yeah. a good way to start up there yeah so that is a great transition into already the second one that you actually recommended yes, because it's about yes. Illustrator. <laughs> because Illustrator supremacy, this is what I'm about. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I had the opportunity to meet Sunny Elmer the last time on my session. And well, part of watching this was because I knew him, but also I was really curious about how um, I could optimize my workflow. So as I said, usually I'm just opening some stuff and doing things uh, how I already like always did them. And the cool thing is watching the workflow and afterward watching the Meg Lewis Adobe Live. So while we had the conference, Adobe Live had some Adobe Max sessions and Meg Lewis, which is my one of my absolute favorite designer was there. And she was saying exactly the same thing. So I can succeed while yeah. knowing nothing about the software. But I did watch the sessions and I've learned pl plenty of things. I won't lie. I had never changed my workspace <laughs> in <laughs> 10 plus years of using Illustrator. So I did, and spoiler alert, it's way easier. It's better. <laughs> no, I really like seeing how people like structure their work because I'm actually the same. Like I've been doing things like the structure of how you work. Like yeah. for me, it's editing a photo for you. It's an illustrator. It's like you get used to it and then you see someone else doing it differently and you're like, oh, damn. Yeah, definitely. And also I think a lot of creative are not thinking about their software so much, which is great because the software shouldn't shouldn't get in the way of your creativity. But part of not engaging with what you can do about the, the soft and rearranging your workspace is also making it easier for you to forget about it, if it makes sense. So yeah. this is what I really, really liked about those three sessions. It was really an explanation of how to navigate it, how to make sure like everything is easy, to how to set new shortcuts, how to rearrange your, your workspace, everything that could help you just to do the thing you want to do without thinking about this up. So I really like that. Yeah. I'm already seeing some people answering the question. Yay! Zendaya, I watched that too. That was really nice. Yes. Oh, Making it. graphics for film also cool. Ooh. Yes, iPad launch. I yes. Thank you so much, guys. Keep it coming. I really want to exactly. have more recommendations so I can watch more Adobe Max sessions. I think it's the Annie Atkins session. And yes, that's also here. 
please go watch it. It was amazing. Uh, it touched my heart. It was so good. But yeah, keep them coming. Yes. So should we just quickly jump to our last new feature section here? Yes, same. This might be surprising because uh, so Woodkid was one of the, the, the big celebs that um, talked about their, um, their way to engage with the softwares. And for me, what was really, really interesting about him is his way to go about his work. Mm -hmm. uh, so to sum it up, he was guided by the constraints of his software. So most, most creative will as I said, try not to think too much about the software and try to have it as like invisible as possible. And for him, it was actually what was guiding his creativity. So thinking about, okay, I know that this is possible. This is not possible. This is a quick way to achieve my goal. This will be cheaper. So having in mind what the, the software makes possible for him was how he built up on his creativity and how he achieved his goals so yeah. i do think it's really important to consider that it kind of challenged the like a belief i have about like not thinking too much about about well features or about softwares when in fact when you're in a creative industry you have to be smart about those things like if you have a client coming to you being like okay we have this amount of time and we have like this much money what can you do obviously thinking about okay so this will take too long or mm. this is too much of a hassle yeah. and if we have to do like millions of different adaptation this will this will be too much is a great way to optimize i think yeah also knowing what a what a software can do how much time it takes like understanding the whole machine behind it because i think oftentimes we don't know i mean for me when i see other artists i see their work sometimes i don't know if that is something that takes days or something that takes just a few hours yeah and i think when i saw his stuff i was like mind blown to be honest because first you hear what kid and you're like oh a musician i know yeah. his songs and then i saw his work and i was just like Boom. It was so incredible. And then knowing how much time and effort goes into that. And then obviously that is something when you know the software, when you know what you want to do and what you can do and what also you can't, like what's not possible. Definitely. Like great things can happen. I was blown away. I feel yeah. like his rationale around his work is super interesting. And I would, yeah, encourage everyone to watch that. Yeah, me too. I was really impressed. And it was absolutely not what I expected because... Oh, exactly. I thought, I don't know, I don't even know what I expected, but definitely not what I got in the end, so. It's because we tend to think he's only a musician, so mm. I thought he would talk about creativity in this aspect and discovering that, well, he's a musician, an extraordinary musician, he's a super cool designer as well, and he's doing 3D and he knows how to do motion design. He was like, oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I was, really? like, I was slightly amused, like, how can you be good yeah. at all of these things at once? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so that I think is for the new features. There are also a lot of live streams this week. There were already some, there's another one tomorrow. You can still watch the ones from this week and also tune in tomorrow where they're going to be talking about a little bit more about the new features as well. Definitely. We're going to jump into our second section, which is the business tips that we got because that is something I was super excited about because it's I think not often talked about and I really like getting insights on that from people from within the creative community and just hearing their stories and tips and how did they get started how did they get to where they are now so and it's just for me as someone working as a photographer I think very um, important to also know what are the other ways you could be doing things. Definitely. I think there is this ideal image of the creative that is that just have to create and everything else will follow, which is not true at all. Um, I think we're not really informed on the business side of things, which is a huge part of our job. 
So yeah. I think this yeah. has, I think, really helped to, well, put in perspective the fact that, yes, you can be creative and yes, you can focus on that if you're working with agents or if we're working in-house, but you still need to understand how building your career is working, how mm. the business yeah. is working, how to sell. So yeah, it was it was really interesting to have those different perspectives. Yeah. What would you say, how many percent of a creative work, like the work of a creative is business? Because I, I would have a very high number in mind, but what, what do you think? <laughs> I think it really depends because, so I started my career in house and I would never, or obviously I would think about business, but for the company, if it makes sense, like is the solution I'm working on, like, helping on this side of thing but the personal business for me was not a thing while when i started freelancing obviously it took so much of my time because for the first time i had to understand okay how to find clients how to charge these clients how to convert these clients and it's a lot of things you won't be yeah. thought about at school yeah. or really like fast and yeah. quick little okay you need to do this this is this and that but then you in real life and you have no idea how to interact with clients with people how to well navigate the creative industry really yeah it's i think it's something that people extremely underestimate how much exactly. administrative stuff goes into working as a creative like managing yourself if you're a freelancer and also the struggles that come with it like I think there's a lot of like stress that comes with it and that is like leading into the first um, session that I really enjoyed because it was Adam. Adam is a designer from New York. I think he moved now, but he was originally from New York. He does great stuff. Really check out his work. It's very like it puts you in a good mood if you okay. look at it and he has super cute quotes. And he also, I mean, you can't see them now, but you got free pins from him when you watched his session, which for me was just like so cool. the cherry on top. Um, because he talked to two of his friends, they're all like uh, freelancers or self-employed about also how the whole pandemic is affecting freelancers as a business and yeah. what you can do. And also the struggle with, you are self-employed, you're a freelancer, and you are in this environment and you then have to balance your life, the pandemic situation, not being able to go to your studio, still running a business, yeah. still being able to like find funding, find clients, find new ways to engage with them. And what I really enjoy that they had a conversation, like it's very clear that they know each other and they have the exchange of ideas. And it's very, it's basically like you're sitting at a kitchen table with some friends and you're just, you're part of them and you're just listening to them talk, which I really, really enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it's really relevant right now, because as you said, With the pandemic, there's so many things changing. So I've actually seen two trends, like people losing clients and people gaining clients. I think it's de depend on, uh, it depends on, well, how uh, needed your creative career is at the moment. Because yeah. At the beginning of the pandemic, everyone was like freezing their budgets. No one wanted to spend anything until they figured stuff out. And I think it had, slowly like picked up since at least in design but yeah. the situation is not the same for everyone because when you just start out and when you don't know exactly how to position yourself or how to reach out to clients the pandemic can ruin your the beginning of your career yeah. so yeah and just how to like work around that not to put too much pressure on yourself which we're going to talk about later because that was addressed in multiple sessions yeah. um but Because, yeah, for photographers, for example, for me, taking photos of uh, humans and usually having quite the big crew on set, it was obviously very challenging. But then it's always very comforting to see that you're not alone in that struggle. And that is yeah. something we can all go through together. So I think, yeah, if you want some insights, also how other people handle the situation right now, I would recommend this uh, session. 
And so the session in the middle, I think we're both are really, yeah. really big fangirl moments um, yeah. about this session. Do you wanna do you wanna talk a little bit, like introduce it a little bit? Okay. So well, first and foremost, I think um, I was a fan of Kate Morris and their universe first, the graphic universe there they developed. So obviously I've watched the, um, the session, but I think it was really, really interesting because it was really genuine and simple. So they are talking about um, how they set up their, their business and how it's working, the nitty gritty, like how they've built the studio that's called Studio Moros and how it implies working with other people, managing a team, hiring product managers, but also doing accounting, um, talking yeah. with clients and yeah. I think it was really super interesting to see how you can yeah transition from being freelance and being in your like this little individual to owning a studio building your studio and yeah make it I think work. You're right, like it was a very genuine of like, if you realize you at some point have so much work that you can outsource it to other people yeah. or you can hire other people, then this is the moment where you can like emerge into founding your own studio. What I also really liked was the aspects that they pointed out about you have to be willing to teach other people yeah. to like, it's you move a little bit away from just being like, creative you it's even more than in general like administration teaching people teamwork like coordinating producing and that is obviously like you have to be aware of that before you make that decision but that is why it's so great that people are so transparent with what it actually takes how much work it is yeah and and what is asked from you definitely i i think their session was for me in especially interesting because it's short but really mm -hmm. packed with information and when they say that right now they're like the core of their job is talking i yeah. think it helped me realize that maybe this is not the right path for me personally because i don't want i don't want to to be that person i don't want to to just talk i want to be involved and to keep designing so i think even for people that don't plan on opening a studio it was great to understand exactly what is at stake when you yeah. want or consider or think about creating a studio and making it work so that's very funny because for me it was the complete opposite yeah, yeah. i i watched this and was like oh my god this all of this sounds so cool yeah. i would absolutely be down to do all of these things planning yes administrative things yes <laughs> like <laughs> but maybe i'm just a little nerd in that sense some of them have to do it so i guess <laughs> yeah i was very inspired by it and i was like oh I my was, god maybe I, I have a new career path that <laughs> just just opened up which once again is a great transition into our next sex yes. section that we have here which is about different career paths you can have yeah definitely so uh this is first and foremost this is another adam so different adam from the <laughs> yeah we just realized we took like two men with the yeah. same name Oops. and this session was really informative and i think it really resonated with me because um to sum it up it was um about how many paths you have when you were creative or when you were in a creative industry and you yeah. want to to move to some something else you want to plan for your next job uh one thing that really bothered me when i started uh, my career was that it felt like it was one unique linear path from being a designer to being a manager and ultimately well maybe owning your studio or being the head of design at, at some big company so very much what i had in mind um when i watched the kate mora session um at, at the beginning of my career i was like okay so at some point i need to stop designing and i was not okay with that but i felt like okay so maybe this is the only way you can success um Oh, you can have like a, a successful career when you 
you're in a creative industry and Adam is doing a great job at explaining that it is not the case. It, it was true at some point because we had more rigid structure, but then he's explaining with like a lot of graphs, mm -hmm. uh, all the different type of career you could expect when you are engaging um, in a creative path and how you can make it unique to you and how you need to ask yourself what I want to do. And what I liked about it was the openness. So it was like, okay, so maybe you're a designer and now you want to be a strategist and you want to stop design. And in his talk, everything was possible. It was a matter of learning how to do the next job so being aware that okay i might not have the skills right now but if i really want to do that this is what i need to do and the second thing i really liked about that was it had a segment about uh, exemplifying some, some yes. of yeah some of the um, the creative path uh, people yeah. had took and um had taken i i don't know had taken yeah, maybe I've taken. <laughs> but I really like the fact that uh, you could see real people with their, their timeline. Everyone was unique in their mm -hmm. career. And first, it was informative because you could see every step. And then second, you could see the little epiphany throughout their career, which I really liked. The fact that uh, for someone, they noticed after I think six years being the, in the creative industry, oh, I actually needed to have a mentor way sooner. And I think having this perspective of, okay, this is why my, like how my career looked like. And this is the point where I started to like wonder about this or that, or the reflection and lesson for me was super, super useful. Yeah. And, I also really, really enjoyed the examples because it, for me also, it takes the pressure away of A, having the like one path that you already have in mind and then you just follow that because yeah. you, I feel like throughout the examples, you realize people have changed the ways that they were going, the path that they were on yeah. and it still led them to success. Like they still are doing great work but sometimes you just have to have an open mind. And he also, I think at some point says like, take opportunities that are given to you. Yeah. Maybe even sometime with not really knowing what the outcome is, but I really enjoy these different, like going from working at an agency to freelance yeah. to working in-house, these, you can transition and it's all okay. You don't have to know upfront where you're gonna end up. Yeah, definitely. I think I think young designers are so afraid of like making a mistake, ruin like ruining your career because you've taken the right the wrong like path. And I think this was a good lesson that this can be true. You can only try things on. And it kind of resonated with one advice I stumbled upon that is to this day with me that was like don't let other people decide the ladder you should climb. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of messed with my head a lot of years because I was like, okay, so I'm a designer. Like what should, should we like, what should I do? Or what is my dream career? And instead of being like, what is my dream career? I think I was thinking about what is the dream career? Like what is, yeah. The ideal people have in mind when they're thinking about a yeah. successful designer. So yeah, it was really, really helping to be like, okay, everything is possible. You, I just, I just need to figure what I want to do. Yeah. And once again, what I really liked throughout all the sessions is the transparency behind all these business advice and also different careers because I feel like sometimes we just see an artist, we see a creative and we know what they do at the moment, but we don't know how they got to this point. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's all ups and downs because I think in the beginning of his session, he's also like, welcome to the roller coaster. It's like, <laughs> yes, it's like, it's ups and downs. It's unique in every way. Like everyone's different. Every career is different. The opportunities that are given to you are different, but it's all like, good in the way like yeah, everything can lead you to a place where you're happy and you do great work 
I think the fear of like messing up your career is also rooted in the fact that when you you're seeing some someone talk about their career and when you hearing a, po a podcast or something, most of the time people yeah are talking about their success story and sometimes they can kind of like leave aside the the struggle part or the challenges and you'll have this idea in mind that there is a straight path to success and if you are not on it then you are a failure or you did something wrong when it's not true i think most of the the, the seasoned creative that told about a genuine like perspective a genuine image of their career are always telling stories about how out it was about the decision they made that wouldn't work for them then they had to reassess and they had to start again so yeah for, like i think for new creative on the scene it's really important to have this in mind that yeah if it's okay like if you you're in a position where it doesn't work for you right now you might want to change that and there is like no wrong like absolute wrong decision you can make so yeah, yeah. And I also like that a lot of people pointed out, like a lot of other sessions as well, it takes time. And that is absolutely normal. Like I think, especially now with social media and everything that we feel like you need to have fast success, that is the only yeah. way to be actually successful. But there have been so many creatives that have been working for years and years and years on their craft to find their style. There was another um, photographer, he was also like, yeah, I didn't like what I was doing for a really long time and it yeah. took me a long time to find what I really enjoyed and what was my voice and what I wanted to put out in the world so I think it's important for people to know to be patient with yourself which is something yeah. I'm completely I'm very bad at it so I'm not the one <laughs> like I don't practice what I preach at this point but I know it is important it's you have to to find what you want to do in order to to show it to the world and and Yeah, it's it's okay if this takes time, and it also is okay if it takes some some downs and. Yeah, definitely. I, I think there's also this wider discussion about social media and how the creative industry, uh, it is like as it is now, is showcasing a highly curated image of uh, what we're doing of our work, and most of the time you're seeing the final product, even when it's when we are talking about the project you will see the, the, the final images and not yeah. all the messy, um, I think... All the tears and sweat that, that goes yeah, into that, it. Yeah. That, and I personally struggle with social media. I never know what to share, how to share it. But I'm always yeah. really aware that I don't want to project that. I don't want to like showcase this image of, oh, I have everything like together and I know exactly what I'm doing and this is a breeze and everything. It's not the case. Obviously, I'm proud to, to, to show what I've done and how I reached this point, but I'm always afraid I would give the wrong like perception of image of me because mm. we're all struggling. We all wondering yes and someone said in the chat as well there was a stream from camille we talked about her oh, yeah, before camille, too yeah, yeah exactly where she and she's the, i watched hers and i was so like happy to hear her say that and someone said it just in the chat now she said it took her 10 years to get to where she is and look at her and like that is like you need she also had a side job and was working and hustling and now yeah. look at it like it's just that is something that's so encouraging to to keep on pushing and not stop like yeah. it doesn't matter how slow you're going just keep walking you know isn't it to work for you first and foremost i think we need also to stop having these harsh judgments when you're not full a full-time creative and you have a job on the side or a day job um it's actually important to like uh, it's relating to another session we will talk about later on but I think this, there's this idea that we have to be the pure creative, just living for their art and breathing hard. Mm -hmm. But the reality of the world is we need to sustain ourselves. So 
Yeah. I think as long as you're having something that works for you, you're not less of a creative because you need to pay your bills. So yeah, yeah. I think that is a great uh, transition into our last and favorite slide of today. Yes. We're going to go over about to the inspiration part because, oh my God, there were so many yes. great videos about inspiration. And even if like I'm not a designer, but I watched like, for example, we're going to talk about her later um Roxanne Gay as a writer and I feel inspired even though I'm not a writer yeah. but it's like you can be inspired by so many things by people from different kind of definitely arts and I was just to my little new happy body, self I think within the creative industry and I would actually like um that like having wider conversation because we're talking about creation and talking about design conception but everyone is doing that in the creative industry and this is exactly what you uh, what you were saying in the at the beginning the fact that we're not in the same in industry but we still have interesting conversation because we ultimately have this with the same questions the same yeah. doubt. um we're searching about like we search we're searching for the, the same answers and to me the creative industry really shines when we have this wider conversation about why how like this whole creativity what how can we do something with it for the people yeah, for me, yeah. Um, also lift each other up like support yeah. each other um learn from each other i think that is a very important aspect for me as well um that you see other people's work and you also see like we're going to talk about diversity later on how to talk about these topics, how to handle these topics. And for me, that is something that I find really inspiring when I especially see people, how they deal with current events in their art, um, yeah. political events, stuff like that, I think. Yeah. Um, and that is something that once again is the same for all artists, doesn't matter what kind of um, art you do. Yeah. Definitely. But I think we're gonna still start up like with a little bit of a lighter, Yeah. one and we're gonna deep dive yeah definitely after and actually decision for me is really important because well first and foremost i think it was really obviously there's something that resonated with me because um so emily started her project which was like a newspaper full of happy news because she was depressed and because her mental health was a like in complete shamble and she needed that mm -hmm. and there's two things about that i think which are really important to me. First, the fact that, well, as a creative, I'm also struggling with my mental health and yeah. I feel like finding solutions and channeling through creativity, um, what you have inside or try, trying to find a way to deal with what you're feeling with art or with creativity for me is a super important idea and a good way to cope yeah the second thing obviously is about spreading a positive message for me um the the intent and willingness to make the world better is obviously core to what i would want to do with my heart or with my skills mm -hmm. and having this small idea so this session is really really cool because it starts as a way for her to well cope with her mental health and her surroundings but then it makes waves and she understands that so many other people need what she brings into the world and oh my god i cannot begin to explain how this idea makes me deeply happy and hopeful And ultimately, this is what I want for, well, every creative, but also for myself, having this, your practice align with mm. something bigger, such as making the world a better place for me. It's the quest, the quest of a lifetime, but I do think even when we're doing small things or we're, we're having jobs at companies, this should be the focus to... Mm. be positive and to help shape the world for well 
the future and the, the wider population, like make sure you're helping people out, you're making the world kinder and better one project at a time. To me, it's the yeah. absolute goal. I think we're, we're like having the best trans transitions into our segments today <laughs> because the the second one, the Roxanne Gay, which I just watched yesterday because you recommended it and I was yeah. just mind blown by it. And she is a writer and she's asked in this um, session the question that I'm going to ask you now, Ooh. which kind of is a little bit in line which, with what you said now. Do you think that artists have a responsibility to show current events or like what is happening in the world through yeah. their art? Because we already talked a little bit about like yeah. prior to this, we talked about it, but I really want to know your answer. Um, I think this is a tricky question because so spoiler alert in her session, uh, Rekhan Gay says that uh, artists should not like constrain their yeah. creativity. And even if I was a bit surprised, Me I think too. I understand that creativity is something we are doing for ourselves, something we are putting in the world, and ultimately this should be free. But at yeah. the same time, I cannot like think about the current world and be like, I should be create like creating whatever, and this has no importance and no meaning. So obviously, I think my views are skewed by the fact that I'm a designer and mm. being a designer is not exactly being an artist. It's actually shaping the world. So it, obviously there's art in that, but yeah. the main focus is to shape the world and to be a, a translator and a bridge between someone that is doing something, a project that has an idea, and an audience, someone like that will use something. So we cannot say that we have freedom in what, in what we're doing, obviously, and especially right now, we have a duty to like stand against um, racist or bigoted ideas and to do that full force because we've been having this conversation about diversity and racism and um, anti-LGBTQ um, ideas that are so present in in our society that we need to stand against that and there's a lot of biases that comes into play when you're building a product because it's the sum of who's in the room at yeah. the moment uh, where the thing is created. So I do think we have a responsibility to question our biases, to try um, to make something as accessible, as kind and as understanding as we can. Yeah. Not for the purely creative thing, I also feel, but it's personal, that I have a duty to like uphold some hmm. or defend uh, some values or say it out loud because for a lot of time I kind of silenced myself first because I felt like okay but who I am to talk about this I have hmm. no like I don't have more knowledge as like the next designer or the next um, illustrator so why would I say something when maybe my views are not completely informed or maybe I'll make a mistake and misrepresent something I want to defend or maybe... So there were a lot of fears around that and I think an imposter syndrome going on like, okay, my voice doesn't matter. Yeah. And I, I was also afraid because um, taking a stand sometime can actually... Oh yeah, I can well. very much relate to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Well, I think I'm kind of because I also I was first of all also very surprised by the answer to be honest because I thought she would also be more pushing a little bit for um, critical voices, which she then she kind of went yeah. there a little bit. But I myself also have the feeling that. I have a responsibility with what I show and what I put out in the world. Like sometimes we forget that 
stuff we do has the potential to maybe change someone's mind or open someone's eyes about something. At least I sometimes forget that and I don't want to. Like I want to be very cautious about this and I want to create art that is important to me and that um, gives value to everything, like to the people that watch it and also to the current situation. So I was, I don't think I have a like concrete answer if I say yes or no, do I think we should only create this or we should not have restrictions? We should just create what we want to. But I do understand your point of feeling like, why am I being entitled to just thinking my opinion yeah. matters by putting my opinion out in the world and then also making yourself a little bit vulnerable in yeah, being like, hey, this is my standpoint on maybe a controversial yeah. discussion or something that is emotional and sensitive. Obviously, you have to be ready at some point to get a bit of backlash, or at least I'm sometimes scared of backlash. Yeah, um, definitely, because there's a lot of hate on the internet. So there's a, there's yeah. that as well. There's like being exposed to to like other views and other people is fine until actually it's pure aid so yeah. they're legitimate i think fear behind that but yeah. at some point i think i realized how important it was to even if i i'm not special by any mean and i won't revolutionize anything by putting my art out there i'm put i put i'm putting aside someone else's and someone else's did something else so there is i think strength in numbers and this is how i kind of <laughs> um i think forced my brain to like do something because in the meantime maybe it won't change anything but me not speaking means like i'm silent i'm not expressing anything i'm mm -hmm not siding with anything so i'm safe but yeah. there's a lot of people that cannot afford to be safe so i think there's a balance here yeah. i actually liked that her answer was unpredictable because you could tell yeah. that she's so raw and genuine in her approach yeah. creation that she also knows how to protect herself and yeah. not having this dispropor disproportionate sense of responsibility if it makes sense yeah because i do feel like um underrepresented communities yeah. feel like hugely responsible for our image and what we're doing for the struggle and how we're portraying, portraying it and it can be exhausting and not everyone has the shoulder for that the energy for that so i can understand yeah why we would not do we would not want to do that and also i think we have a right to be just the creative we want so obviously i will never like go on a like black girl illustrator <laughs> comment section to be like oh you should defend this and that no so why yeah. would i like judge myself being like you should not be happy right now. <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I mean, in general, this interview was very genuine. I think it's something that talks about that a lot. And it's just for me, like I said, I don't really have a complete answer. It's just something, it gives you a lot to think about and to also think about why you want to create and how do you want your voice to be heard if that makes sense and that's also going into our last section because we're already we're aiming for like we're on the finish line already Ooh. almost so, but okay. we really want to talk about the last um session that we have here yeah. Antoinette Carol which I mean I also, also I think um, both sessions are actually my favorites because it kind of it gave different perspective about the same type of issues and mm -hmm. with internet i think it was really important to address this so the wider um thing i think is to confront the fact that there's a certain hypocrisy um about calling the design community empathetic per se 
because being a designer doesn't mean you're empathetic. It, it means you have the capacity to be and to ask questions, to wonder about things, but it can be not really genuine to be like, oh yeah, well, I'm a designer. I'm used to being someone else's shoes when it's, it's untrue. We can tell like from the millions of examples we have about things people design without consideration for the other people that would use it or the people it would exclude because obviously you have biases, but also you're creating starting with your experience, your mm. views of the world. So it can just be blind spots. You're not questioning because you're in this state of I, I am like inherently yeah. empathetic and yeah. a good notion she brought is humility. So she actually uh, advocated for centering humility in the design practice and uh, adding it next to empathy mm -hmm. uh, so we could gain this understanding that emp empathy is something you need to gain, you need to work on, and humility is about recognizing that you're flawed and you yeah. have biases and it's not the worst thing if you question that yes. if you, you're ready to be like okay what are the biases i'm bringing to the table or yes. what is something i don't know about and this point is especially interesting because i think as creative or as, as designers we have a huge trouble to to just say I don't know I guess because we're a bit insecure we just gain our spots sometimes we sit at the table and we need to defend that as much as we can but I feel like yeah. even at the beginning of my career I was just so scared to say I have no idea and <laughs> this should be like front and center because otherwise we're just pretending that we know about stuff and mm -hmm. it's kind of masking a problem because we'll then go and build our algorithm saying i know what's best when it's not yeah the and it can actually be dangerous at some point if people just keep on it pretending at, and like at that level for example what i really enjoyed as well was that um it was not that she was lecturing in the sense of like um you should do this you should yeah. do that she put it in perspective she went back to herself gave examples where where everything made sense and was so clear what she was trying to get across it was not something where you were told what's wrong and what's right it was explained to you in a way where you after watching this session you're like yes all of this makes yeah. so much sense how have i not been thinking about this before like yeah because it's a it's a process definitely so i think she did a great job um of yeah. presenting it not as just some changes you need to to make and then everything will be fine but a yeah. constant work of trying to question ourselves um, about what we're doing, what is the greater purpose. And I think there's a really, really important conversation to be had um, about ethical design, about what we're enabling uh, as designers and multiple yeah. tech stories told us that this was not just like the focus when we develop solutions. So I think this session is was especially great for that. I think I actually wrote uh, um, wrote down a few things she said. So she was saying, design is the intent and an intentional, uh, and an, uh, an intentional impact behind an outcome. And I think most of the time we're thinking, okay, design is solving problem, but no, there's like a lot that uh, that is coming with that. Um, she said, humility asks us to step outside of ourselves, listen, and absorb someone else's truth, even if it makes us defensive. And she had 
especially, especially in the festival. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's really, really, really important to consider that maybe we're not feeling that great or we are feeling attacked because this is something we hadn't considered and we need to wonder about that. We need to be humble enough not to be like, what are you talking about? I know mm -hmm. this is my job. I'm the expert. So obviously yeah. you're bringing something else at the table and you're an expert on your skills. But at the end of the day, knowing how to align something or what logo looks great doesn't give you inherent knowledge on what's best in an algorithm, how to reach um, all the people, how to make something accessible, how yeah. to make sure you're designing with no harm. So this I, definitely, yeah. Absolutely. I think that is a topic like we both had conversations about this before. Yeah. We could talk about this for hours. I'm hoping we can still make another session about where we just talk about this because this could we could keep on going for another two hours and I'm kind of scared that they will cut us off. So I feel like we should wrap it up a little bit because we are almost at the end of this Maybe session. Say that in the chat if they'd, they'd like to. Yes. Please, if you guys want to have a session just about ethical design, because we would really like to do it, let us know. And yeah, I just wanted to thank you for joining me today because it was, as expected, very lovely and all your wisdom. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me as per usual. It's a delight just to be in your presence. It's so cool to have oh, you. Thank you so much. You. And we actually, for you guys, have also a little clip from the keynote, a little insight on what's new in Lightroom if you have not watched it already. And we will show you the video soon. I hopefully see some of you next week. We will have a cool session with a designer from Colombia living in Finland. It's a whole whole cool and interesting story we're going to talk about that next week and thank you so much for tuning in today and i hope you all have a wonderful day and i see you soon ciao <clears throat>
really bright highlights, really dark shadows, and what the meter said right in between. So for the first step, I'm gonna let Sensei take care of that and adjust the tonality of it. It looks much better. But if I go to adjust the color, we're gonna see that this is gonna make some parts look better and other parts look worse. I need to adjust the color in tones. And this is where color grading comes in. With color grading, I can move between the shadows, the mid-tones, and the highlights, and I can adjust the exact color value within each. So let's start with the shadows, and this is the forest floor here. I'm gonna make that sort of a bluish green and darker. Next, we're gonna to come to the mid-tones where I'm not going to change the color, but I am going to change the luminance. I'm gonna make that fog pop by making it just a little bit darker. Last, the highlights. This is the area where the sun is rising in the upper right, and I want that to be a nice warm tone and a little bit darker. So let's take a look at that before, sort of soft and muddy, and after, really nicely balanced, beautiful, and colorful. There's never been a more precise or powerful way to edit color than color grading in Lightroom. Okay, before we leave the iPad here, let's talk about workflow for a minute. One of the things that I love in Lightroom is that I can now directly import images on the iPad. So I can pull them straight into Lightroom, and that means that these Leica Q2 files here, these 47 megapixel files, they come straight in. I didn't have to copy them into the camera roll first. Now, as you can see, they're not edited, but I have edited one of the images. In fact, if I touch and hold, we'll see that I've done quite a bit of work here. Now, rather than replicate all that work, I just wanna pick it out of that file and share it with the others. And that's called batch processing, and that's exactly what we're gonna do here. Simply touch and hold on the image that we wanna copy from, copy those settings, select all of those other huge 47 megapixel images, and hit paste. And in a couple of seconds, all of those images are gonna look the same. If I'm a working photographer shooting a large volume of images, sports, weddings, portraits, this is gonna save me hours, maybe even days of work. This is a huge deal for workflow. That's just a little bit of what we're doing on the iPad. But the truth is we don't all have our iPads with us all the time. We don't have our desktops or our laptops with us all the time. But we always, we always have our phones with us. So let's take a quick look at this system on the Android phone. And the first thing I wanna stress here is that this is full Lightroom. This is the full power of the system in the palm of your hand. And what that means is that your edits are consistent with what we just did on the other device. And if I come in and I choose my versions, I can adjust those as well. If I come into a powerful feature such as color grading, I can adjust that. In fact, on a black and white image like this, I like to use a global color grading adjustment for sepia tone. This is a really powerful way to do a sepia tone. But I can do really powerful edits here as well. Let's take this image here, which is a 24 megapixel image off of the original Leica Q, a full raw file, a very large raw file. First thing we're gonna do is just hit auto and Sensei is gonna do its work there, make the image look much better. I'm gonna open up the shadows a bit and now we're gonna push it a little bit and do a selective edit of this image. I'm gonna come into my selective tools, choose the radial tool, stretch that out, invert it, add a little bit of clarity or mid-tone contrast, and some dehaze to cut through the atmospheric haze of that. And let's look at that before and after. That's selective raw editing on a full resolution file right here on my phone. Okay, now let's talk about how to learn Lightroom. There's some fantastic resources for learning more about Lightroom. If I come to the Learn tab here, I see that I have curated content. I have all sorts of content that I can browse based on the type of user I am. This is some of the best content from some of the very best professional photographers and authors in the community. And I chose one for us here on a foggy morning recovery, very similar to what we did on the iPad. And as I start this tutorial, Lightroom explains the problem we're going to solve, loads the image, and this is where things get different. I'm actually driving Lightroom. So I'm interacting with the interface, learning not just how to solve the problem, but how Lightroom works. These are incredibly powerful. There are hundreds in here and we're constantly adding to them. It's a great way to learn how Lightroom works. You can see that this entire system has never been more powerful, more precise, more flexible, easier to learn or easier to use.